This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazov Gang. Tonight, the birth of Jesus, the Glazov Gang's Christmas special. And back by popular demand, Peter Hammond, the founder of Frontline Fellowship. Dr. Peter Hammond, who else but to get you for our Christmas special? Thank you so much, Jamie. Great to be back. Thank you so much, Peter. I want to discuss a few things uh, with you today on this Christmas special, especially f focusing on, on Jesus, uh, his, his birthday, the meaning surrounding his birth, and everything else, uh, which should take a few days, if not months and years, but we only have 15 minutes. But Peter, I want to begin with this. Uh, we had a very interesting conversation the other day, and I want to start with that on Christmas truces during wars where both sides that are Christian actually engage in certain behavior. Let's begin with that, Peter. It's an extraordinary thing. Only Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, could bring people during a time of war together and make the guns fall down. And that's happened at my father who fought all six years of the Second World War in the Royal Artillery in the Eighth Army and on the British side, he spoke about how there was a spontaneous Christmas truce in North Africa where he in the Eighth Army and uh, Africa Corps on the other side would sing Christmas carols to one another. And they actually, came on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, they came out and they swapped ration packs and showed pictures of their families and they played football and in no man's land, extraordinary things. But recently, I've been hearing from veterans of, of the wars over the years, I'd hear testimonies, but it's come out to such an extent that even the Imperial War Museum in London now has displays and photographs and evidence of the Christmas truce. In 1914, in the First World War, after a million men had died in the first four and a half months of the war, as it approached Christmas, there were spontaneous ceasefires between the lines and uh, extraordinary things. Uh, near Ypres, for example, a G German unit was putting their Christmas trees on top of their parapets and they started to sing Silent Night. Well, the British on the other side, they knew Silent Night, so they joined in. And before they knew it, as they realized, we sing the same hymns and carols, they came out, swapped ration packs, and, for example, the British had meat pies and the Germans had great chocolate and the French had wine, and they were sharing, swapping hats. You've got these extraordinary pictures on display at the Imperial War Museum of British officers wearing German hats, German officers wearing British hats, mingling together, swapping ration packs, arms and arms. And these have been suppressed over the years because they were considered bad for morale and for the war effort. But now it appears hundreds of thousands of soldiers, British, French, German, Australian, Canadian, South African, and even on the Eastern Front, Russian, German, Austrian, observe the Christmas truce sometimes for weeks. That's an incredible story. Uh, Peter, and also for our viewers, I interchange and go back to Dr. Hammond sometimes. Uh, Dr. Hammond, but just a second, there's also a lot of evidence in history where Muslims and jihadists fighting jihad, when it's Muhammad's birthday, they lay their arms down, they read the Quran, they start hugging Christians and Jewish people. There's a lot of that going on as well, right? Uh, nope, this is actually pretty unique. Only <laughs> Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, yeah. has been known to inspire ceasefires amongst warring sides. And it's yeah. an extraordinary thing. Yeah. I mean, who else but Jesus Christ could bring peace to a war zone? Well, th this is uh, my sense of humor, but also to bring up a profound point, the difference between Islam and Christianity, because one would never imagine this happening uh, in the Islamic world world because if we were to be honest islam brings the sword and christianity brings the cross on which jesus jesus when died. jesus was asked what's the greatest command he said to love god with all your heart soul mind and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself when muhammad was asked he said to believe in allah and his apostle and to participate in jihad so jesus right. said the second greatest command is to love your neighbor muhammad said the second greatest command is to kill your neighbor Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Hammond, let's focus in here a bit. Look, 
Uh, and bri uh, briefly, please, because I, wa I want to uh, get on uh, maybe six, seven things I want to discuss. Dr. Hammond, Christmas is a joyous time, correct? It is. We celebrate in the greatest event, the incarnation, God with us. Thank you. Now, I want to ask something. Jesus' birth is a tremendously joyous time for us. We believe that now, Dr. Hammond, Jesus Christ, the the member of the of the three unit Trinity, always existed. It's just that he came down and took human form by the Holy Spirit through Mary, correct? That is correct. It is the incarnation that we're celebrating at Christmas. Jesus Christ has always existed, but at Christmas, we celebrate that just over 2,000 years ago, he was born in human form. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Right, and so Jesus became man, but because the Holy Spirit helped conceive him, and we believe in the virgin birth, now, so, so Jesus came down. What I'm fascinated by is, did Jesus always know his mission when, even when he was a kid? How do we understand at what age he realized what his mission was and who he was? Some things are a mystery. The, Christ, the scripture is very clear on many subjects. In some subjects, it's not as clear. So there's a certain amount of mystery. We don't know at what stage the Lord Jesus Christ understood his mission and his purpose. But certainly you can see uh, early indications like when he's age 12 with his parents on earth visiting the temple, uh, interacting, discussing great theological things with the wise men in the temple. We can see at the baptism, obviously there was a full understanding as the, as the Holy Spirit came down and the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, but uh, I would believe the Lord understood early on. Right now, now, so Jesus became man, but he was also God. But because of the virgin birth and the Holy Spirit, you know, conceiving him in half, Jesus was born without original sin, correct? He's not completely human. We're, we're all fall So we're all fallen. Humans are fallen, but Jesus wasn't fallen, right? Yes, he was tempted and always like as us, but yet without sin, the weaknesses. He knows what it is to be tempted, but he never gave into it. He didn't have original sin. He is God from God, light from true God from true God, begotten, not created. But wait, I don't understand that. Just a second. It, he was tempted like us in the sense of um, in, in all the ways that humans are tempted, including the flesh, whatever it is. It would appear so. In Hebrews, we are told we do not have a high priest who is unsympathetic to our weaknesses, for he was tempted and always like as we are, yet without sin. It doesn't specify which sins, but obviously the Lord did have a human nature. It was a real human nature. He was He's fully God and he is fully man. And that's what the creeds of the church uh, celebrate. And it's based on the scriptural teachings that we've received. We don't understand everything. Right. It is mystery. But okay, it's a mystery. But so he was born. So he was he was like us and tempted, but he never sinned. That is correct. Okay, Doctor Hammond, let me ask this: Christ's birth, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection. This is a tremendous. I mean, what? What? I mean, do we even find words for this? What? What a victory! Uh, you know, what redemption in it, and what a defeat for Lucifer, for Satan. Um, did Satan know when Jesus was born the threat that it posed to him, or, or Satan was unaware of what exactly the mission was? He couldn't have fully understood, or he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory, we read. But Satan was aware enough of the prophecies and of the threat that when Jesus was born, King Herod sent out the soldiers to kill every child, everyone under age two in Bethlehem. And so you can see the menace of the manger, war on the womb, how the world hates the birth of Christ. Today you have the Antichrist Lawsuit Union, the ACLU, trying to attack any manger scenes. Well, 
it was even worse when Jesus was born. They were literally trying to kill Christ. Well, today you can see a war in the womb too through abortion. Plainly, Satan hated the idea of Christ being born. In many cases, you can see how he also tried to stop the birth of the deliverer, Moses, by having all the male babies thrown in Nile or killed at uh, the birth of Moses as well. So Satan plainly knew something of the threat, and he tried in the most thorough way he could to obliterate uh, God's plan of redemption. Right. He didn't completely understand because he obviously doesn't have you know, Satan knows a lot, but he doesn't have complete access, obviously, to divine knowledge, to God's knowledge. So perhaps he may have even been behind killing Jesus on the cross, thinking that he was succeeding in some way, correct? The scripture even says this, that if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, speaking of the demons. So plainly, there, it, it was demonic, it was satanic, the whole move to crucify the one perfect holy person, the most loving person the world has ever seen. A, a man who's healed the sick and who's raised the dead, who's cleansed lepers, why would you want to kill him? And yet there was this hatred because they, they recognized. So there is a real satanic side to it. And I think we can read this as we read the vindictiveness of how they treated Christ. And what had he actually done wrong? Dr. Hammond, so as Christians on Christmas Day, what should be two, three things that we should be joyful and cheerful about and what, how should we be spending our time? Christmas is a great celebration. And I know that some have paganized and secularized and materialized. Uh, that's uh, obviously not for us Christians. But we as Christians want to have a Christ-centered Christmas. We want to celebrate the advent, the incarnation of God and Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And you just think of that great verse in Isaiah 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now, here we just see so much, and if you just think, for example, of a Christmas tree, it should remind us of the fact that there was a tree of life in the garden, which uh, we were excluded from because of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which which we were, our ancestors were commanded not to eat of, which we did. And so the wood of the tree should remind us of both the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which the first Adam partook of and lost us the original state of innocence, and the tree of life that will be in the new Jerusalem, which we will freely partake of. And it should remind us of the wood of the crib in the stall in the cave where Jesus was born. There wasn't a room from in the inn. And so, but that wood of the crib should remind us of the wood of the cross. He was born to die. And it should also, as we think of the decorations around a tree, think of the gold of the crown. Yes, Jesus was born in a stable, in a humble way. He died on a criminal's cross. He died for our sins. He took our sin upon himself, but he is destined to the throne, to the crown. So the crib, the cross, the crown. Oh, and look at the gifts that the wise men brought. The wise men brought gifts to, to the Lord, frankincense for the high priest above all priests, gold for the king above all kings and the Lord of lords, and myrrh for the sacrifice that will end the need for any other blood sacrifice. What appropriate gifts. We give gifts on Christmas, and we should remember whose birthday it is, because of the greatest gift that God gave through in and through his son, Jesus Christ. And so there's so much in Christmas that is there for us to rejoice and to reach out. Wise men still seek Christ. Thank you very much, Dr. Hammond. Our time is up, but in 30 seconds, uh, jihadists go crazy during this time. And so it's also a reminder that during this joyous, joyous occasion celebrating Jesus' birth, that at the same time, this crucifixion continues and continues and continues in terms of Christians being part of the body of Christ and jihadists perpetrating their genocide. And we need to keep shining a light on that, and that's what you do, right? Yes, we had a missionary in Egypt earlier this year, and they suffer a lot. There's a lot of attacks on Christmas. There's there's just been another bombing of St. Mark's a Church in Cairo. And there was a workshop a while ago for Christians in Egypt where the t 
title of the workshop, a day workshop, is when you are martyred, not not if, when you are martyred, how will you use this opportunity to bring the most glory to Christ? And one of the participants' suggestion was, I want to say to ISIS, the Muslim Brotherhood, or whoever it is that is going to martyr me, you do not take your life from, my life from me. I lay it down of my own free will because I want you to know Jesus Christ, the only Lord and Savior. I, I mean, imagine how many people turn out to a workshop like that in your country or my city, and yet it was a packed out one. The Christians in the Middle East are suffering. Let us remember our brothers and sisters in Christ under fire now for the faith. Dr. Hammond, profound stuff as always. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you so much. Let's keep seeking Christ and lifting him up and reminding people that Jesus is the reason for the season. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. Merry Christmas to all of our viewers of the Glazoff gang, and we'll see you soon. Good night.